Hello and welcome to The Found Cause, where we have found our cause in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Michael, the man behind the machine, kind of. You can see my whole setup right here, looking like I'm in a command station. And to my real life left, or right, right, your left is... Sebastian, the bookkeeper. I can't believe it, Sebastian. You are here in person. We're together in this beautiful professional studio of ours with the big old timeline behind us. You can see, by the way, Adam at the very far left over there for... My far right, your far left. And then right here is the Tower of Babel. I'll go into all the nations. Wow. And this only goes on for eons and eons this way. Um, how's it been, Sebastian? It's been a while since we were together. And look, I think we're actually legitimately six feet apart now. So um, don't kill us, Governor Waltz. That's our governor, right? Yes. Governor Waltz. Yes. <laughs> it's been quite all right. Pretty chill going back to my apartment. I think you know, mentioned that in previous podcasts. That was a big thing, a big transition. Living on my own. Cooking, doing my laundry. So... It's nice. Yeah, yeah. I'm growing into men. Real men with big timelines. You don't have a timeline. You don't have any wall decoration going on right now, do you? <laughs> it looks like I live in a bunker. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've got a timeline to recommend for you. And maybe one day the sound calls will invest in its own large, obscure timeline that nobody will buy for your wall decoration. Right. right. All right. Speaking of obscure things that nobody likes except for us, I put out a Twitter um, this week and I said, I hate christian philosophy for the most part i i think a lot of times it contributes to that bible verse that says don't encourage don't entertain vain philosophies and and philosophy youtube channels often that's all they do they entertain vain philosophies and basically they put the bible to the side i saw a babylon b article once that said um christian ruins great philosophical debate about god by introducing the bible and like there's all these people at the coffee shop like <laughs> so uh, th that's the part of philosophy christian philosophy that i really detest and that is when they don't put the bible front and center and they talk about like spacey heady things that plato talked about that really don't have any real use any applicable use in real life um i don't like that i don't want to do that but in the spirit of balance I was very interested in this topic, and so we're going to address a heady philosophical topic. We're going to do our best to quote from the Bible when we get to the biblical stuff, but I will warn you, if anybody's like me, the first part of this episode will probably be that same kind of philosophy mumbo-jumbo. So if you want to skip ahead to like 25, 30 minutes or whatever, that's probably where we're going to be discussing all the biblical concepts um, positively, but first we're going to talk about the, the negative and some of the philosophical questions. So the topic, technically, for this video is what makes up who we are you know what defines me or you what makes us distinct um am i going too fast sebastian or you want to say anything before i get into the real chunky philosophy i also don't like philosophy that much i used to like it but then after becoming i mean really the transition to becoming reformed i would say it just it's just, it's just not the same it's 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 unsatisfactory you're speculating talking talking a lot too much and the biggest thing is, as you will, as you will see, hence why we're saying the transition later to actual, into deep diving into biblical evidence, there isn't that just much. When you see those discussions, they very infrequently do they cite the, the Bible. So that's something that also turned me off. But nonetheless, every once in a blue moon, it's interesting to think about. So yes, this is the once in a blue, moon. The blue moon. Yeah. yeah. All right. So first things first, again, what makes me, what makes us who we are? Super heady. So I again, apologize as we've done profusely for the philosophy, but here goes. The question is uh, twofold. And I heard um, James White, one of our favorite theologian guys talking about this the other day, uh, the Christian God and then God's like the Christian God, I guess one's model copying the Christian God are the only ones that can really make sense of what in philosophy we'd call forms of things. There's a very famous, um, I think it's Plato is the one that originated. It could be one of his forefathers that, that talked about things ultimately have some perfect form out there this universal form for example um, a phone right phones have a purpose and phones look different you know even the same model of phone is made up of different atoms so you could have this galaxy s9 and you could have the same one same make some model some color but technically it's different parts sourced from different places so it it's a different phone and if you didn't have categories for things you might call it a completely different thing because this is made up of certain atoms and has my information on it and all that type of stuff and the other phone that's exactly you know it looks exactly the same but it is actually made up of different things it could be a totally different thing you could call this you know a zebu and that thing is zebra because it's, it's right. different but we recognize as species made after image the image of god who also puts things into categories into forms into kinds that 
phones can encompass a large, broad variety of separate, unique things. So this is a unique phone, but there are many like it, not only of the exact same brand and make, but also any smartphone or any phone phone in general. You might call this a smartphone, a little different than a regular landline phone, but in any case, there's a form of a phone that everything kind of conforms to or variates off of. Same thing goes for anything, not just physical things. So you can have beds and phones, whatever. They all have some sort of form that we all recognize as a bed form, um, but also people and kinds. And that's where you get actual biblical evidence, right? The creation Genesis narrative says that God created all creatures and plants and everything according to their kinds. And that doesn't doesn't mean a lot, I think, when I initially read it, when a lot of people initially read it today, but I think it specifies that God had in his head, in his imagination, in his creation, ideas of specified forms of things that you'd be able to distinguish groups of things that were together from each other, right? Like I'm different from you, Sebastian, but we're both the same kind. We're both a person. Mm -hmm. So same thing goes for animals, ants, amoebas, planets, whatever. Planets are their own kind of thing. There are planets, not suns. There are stars, which are suns. There's people, which are humans. There are porcupines, which are porcupines. You know, there's many different porcupines. Right. There's just different species of porcupines, but they're all one kind. Um, so we in the modern day in science have classified things. Certain certain things distinguish species from species. I think uh, inter interbreeding is the thing we use to determine species from different species mm -hmm. but even then sometimes species can interbreed like um horses and donkeys can make a mule mm -hmm. and that mule is just um can have offspring so there's there's all these rules that we make to determine how we determine kind scientifically um, but ultimately we know that god has created some sort of kind so we know that we first aspect of who we are is that though we are separate we're unique beings. I'm made up of different atoms. I have a different attitude, different personalities than you, Sebastian. We're both the kind of humans and more specifically men uh, as opposed to women. So we're men, humans, that's something, right? Made in a mm -hmm. specific kind. God knows exactly what that image is. We are also in and of ourselves, like what am I? Am I just um, a, a beat bag jumbling around like some atheists say? Like, am I just Remember all the words coming out of my mouth and all the emotions that are in my head and all my thoughts, are they just the consequence of atoms moving around and bumping into each other in a certain sequence? Like if you knew my state as soon as I was born, like all the state of my atoms and exactly what trajectory they were moving and, and all the other atoms in the universe and what trajectory they were moving, you know, so that you knew exactly what puffs of air would hit me and what virus molecules might hit me at some point or Corona. A corona exactly <laughs> or you know the electrons that would eventually be emitted that would make my neurotransmitters make me want to cry or whatever you'd be able to tell exactly everything that i was going to do from that moment on for the rest of eternity if you knew perfectly all the laws of physics and then perfectly all the things that were happening am i just physical matter that that is a theory it's not the one that i hold to or sebastian it's not a christian worldview but there, it's a naturalist materialist worldview is that all we are is the matter that we are Others, uh, I think the broad other category, believe that we are more than just physical bodies. Some would say that we, that the physical world is an illusion, or at the very least it's temporary. And that while we do have bodies, or maybe we think we have bodies, we're acting mainly we are the soul that inhabits our body. This, this immaterial, non-matter thing that lives in us and, and, and allows us to do things, right? Like if I was just my body, if I was catatonic and didn't have any brain activity, I would still look like I am and still be breathing and all my body would be operating the same except I wouldn't have any motivation to do anything, speak or eat or pick up things or do anything because mm -hmm. my soul would be gone. And that's what people would call the soul, that motivating factor. And so new age religions have this, Hinduism has this, Christianity of course has this. I believe that they're all pointing to the truth, the, the soul given by God. Um, so we, we would ascribe to, we have our physical body, but we also have a non-physical thing that motivates us and, and, you know, us, what we think of as us because we're thinking in that mode. I'll take it a step further. I mean, this is a preview to the mm -hmm. bigger talk here, but I would take it a step further and say that the Bible actually points out uh, at least a threefold version of yourself. So you're not just body, but you are. You are your body, but you're not just your body. You're not just a soul. I mean, you are your soul. Things motivate you, but you're also a mind. Um, which is distinguished from the soul, or maybe the soul is split into mind and heart. The soul being the like emotions that you have, all your feelings, your guttural feelings, um, 
like if you're sad, that's your soul being sad. If you're in love, that's your soul being in love. And then also your all your rational thoughts, your intellect, I think you'd call it before this episode, Sebastian, your thing, you know, the words that you say, the things you're thinking, your conscious brain, mm-hmm. um, that would be your mind. Your so, rationale as well. Yeah. Your rationale, exactly. So that's a preview of what we're going to talk about. So let's, do you have any comments before we jump into the first of those perspectives so the main takeaway is the qualities that make something that's what you want to drill yeah. that's what gives something essence that's what gives it identity that's what gives it a um, meaning i suppose but what makes it recognizable what makes it stand out as mm-hmm. you were saying you know between keyboards mouses people animals certain specific qualities, certain traits. So that's important to keep in mind. That's what I would say. And also what distinguishes you from the other person. Right. Right. Okay. I think that's a great intro. So let's dive, let's dive in. All right. So I w- let's first take a look at that, that first one I was talking about. People, the philosophy that believes that we are just the physical matter, that that our thoughts are real, but they are actually just electron implu- impulses and neuron impulses or whatever, however the brain works exactly. We're not all sure uh that we're all physical matter in any case so if if you lost half your brain you and everything that makes up you would be genuinely different and now we all agree that you can have brain injuries that cause personality changes um so so that would be i guess support for the fact that we are just what we are we're just physical matter so when we die we're totally dead there's nothing else and it's surprising sebastian if you want to talk about it the 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 diversity in groups that believe this because the first thing i'm thinking of is just this is just an atheist thing but there's a lot of people that believe this yes the main group you might be more familiar with would be jehovah's witnesses because they intertwine the idea that you are a soul that the soul is mixed with your physical with your physical body so right from their jw.org from their website some people say the soul is immortal they hold to the belief that the soul can be destroyed by God. In fact, he will destroy and then make you anew if mm-hmm. you are saved among the elect of their people. So that's their position on that aspect. And also that they really emphasize the connection with the with the physical body. So not, o- not only, how can I explain? It's not... It's the mind and your body that make up a soul. Hence why they take literally the passages that say that God can destroy your soul. That take it as can completely destroy you, completely annihilate you. And that once you are dead, you're done. You're completely done. For example, they would quote uh, Ecclesiastes 9. For the living know that they will die, but they didn't know nothing. They have no further reward and even their name is forgotten. Well. Yeah, and it, it's kind of a JW position, and there's others like this, like the Seventh-day Adventists have a similar position. Uh-huh. Any annihilationists typically take this this approach of this, like, they call it a soul, but it's not really a soul. It's not the soul that you and mm-hmm. I would think of when we hear the word soul. And the, I think the really the only reason they use that language is because it's found in the Bible, and so it's their defense when, when you bring up text with the word soul in it. They say, well... Yeah, we believe in soul, but really what they're saying is the soul is the body Mm -hmm. and that the body, you know, you have personality and you have thoughts, but they're all physical according to both the natural materialists, that those are the atheists, they don't believe in any spiritual things, and the the Jehovah's Witnesses and others that believe in just body, they just call it a soul. But it's it's really deceptive, I think, because it's just body. That's all it is. They're using a different, they're using a different word. Yeah, trying to trying to mix it in, because they say that you know the the soul needs to eat. I mean, this is from there. Sometimes the term is used to describe an animal. Furthermore, the Bible describes the soul as needing food. In Deuteronomy, they say, if a soul were an entity separate from the body, would it need to breathe or to eat? In the Bible, the word for soul most often refers to a complete living person, including the body, emotions, and the personality. So, really. And we're, we're, but what they try to do is they they're leaning more on the body on the body aspect and just using the word soul for that yeah and i think a couple uh, pokes that maybe this won't be super organized but a couple arguments against that i think from scripture if you look to eating for instance i think that your soul so if you 
if your soul is your heart, so I'm ascribing to the threefold or at least threefold piece of yourself. So that your body is separate from your soul and your soul is separate from your mind, but all together they make up who you are. And so I think the soul yearns for food and drink and that's what makes you go and eat. Mm-hmm. Now your body also can tell you, oh, I'm hungry, oh, I'm thirsty. But we all know times where we eat and are drunk when we weren't like bodily thirsty or bodily hungry, but we did want, like for for instance, if you think about a candy bar you might or or you're just bored or something i don't know there's a lot of times when you eat and drink where your body isn't telling you you're hungry or thirsty Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but your soul is so i i think your soul can be hungry and thirsty and want to eat and drink without being attached to your body Um, in with with some support from that from the bible jesus gives that parable of lazarus lazarus and the rich man that parable where the rich man lazarus are both on earth lazarus is repentant and he's poor and the rich man is rich and not repentant so when they die lazarus ends up going to hades but the good side the paradise side with with in abraham's bosom is what they call it and then uh, the rich man goes to the bad side of hades the she all suffering side. So the rich man is on the bad side of Hades and he is calling out to Moses and Abraham saying, can I at least get a drop of dew from, from the grass up there? Because I'm, because my the tongue is thirsty. Mm-hmm. Well, clearly the rich man didn't have his earthly body. His earthly body was dead, but he was somehow still thirsty in his side. Mm-hmm. And I don't know that he, he, I don't think he clearly, he can't die on that side from thirst. So it must not be a physical need for h2o because he doesn't have a body that right. would perish if he didn't i think it is a soul thirsting to drink that he is not satisfied with and therefore i think the soul can't i don't think it's a good support for the soul being and the body being the exact same thing um saying the soul wants or needs to eat and drink because i think the soul can want to eat and drink without having anybody well that's interesting you know, interesting connection yeah i think uh, Normally, I would say most people wouldn't think about the Lazarus and the rich man with that, but that's that's interesting because you know they are they are in they're dead, but nonetheless, that man still has craving for for uh, for quen- for quenching himself, and also there will there will be sensation. I'm thinking more thinking more about it too. There will be sensations in hell because Jesus describes it as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mm-hmm. Well, you still have your emotions with you. Yeah, we not have your. So it's a place of torment. Would it be like stabby torment? No, because you don't have a body, but it still be will still be mental. So that's interesting that you can still have those sensations even though you don't have a physical body. Mm-hmm. And principally that also gets to the whole annihilationism thing too because the whole reason for the for them constructing this soul and body are the same and and everything like this jw's and and others that ascribe to annihilationism is also because they want you to be gone once you go to hell because they don't want to have the reality of people suffering forever in hell and therefore they tie the soul and the body together because we know that the body can be destroyed and would be destroyed in some fiery lake of fire right Um, so Thusly, it makes sense in the JW scheme of things that if the body and soul are connected and it's thrown and the body soul is thrown into the second death, that you're just totally destroyed, right? The body's gone and therefore you are gone. Um, but weirdly, I, so I think that's actually the origins if I had to play, you know, detective on why they've done this, why they've combined the body and the soul. But mm-hmm. it, it gives them a lot of problems, to be quite frank, because I've talked to, to Jehovah's Witnesses in the past um, and I've asked them. So so they're really into rules. They're a law-based religion. They, they say... If you follow these rules, you you can possibly make it to heaven, right? That you hope you make it to heaven. There's no assurance in the Jehovah's Witnesses' faith. Uh, there are for a very select few, but whatever. Not to get into super details there, but mm-hmm. um, they they'll say they're working hard, and it is hard to follow all the law and an extra law that's not even in the Bible, so that they can make it to heaven. But then ultimately, I ask them. Well, it's not really you that makes it to heaven, is it? You're doing all the work here. But when you die, you believe that you are gone. Like, because your body is dead, you're dead. Like, there's no brain activity, you're gone. There's no spirit. There's no spiritualness in Jehovah's Witnesses. Like, even the Holy Spirit doesn't exist in Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, Firstly, because they're not Trinitarian, but also they don't Mm -hmm. believe it's a thing. They don't believe that... They believe spirit is like a different body. It's a different kind of body, physical body, not a a non-material thing. And so... Um, there's no Holy Spirit. It's just like a force of God. And so you don't have a spirit. When you die, there is no activity. You're sleeping in the most literal sense. And so when God raises you up again, he has to recreate you. He's not He's not 
taking your soul like we think of. He isn't taking your soul and putting it into a new Mm -hmm. body. He actually remembers what you were like and recreates you. And there you are, you know, in Sebastian 2.0. And you're in your new body and you have all the same memories that Sebastian 1.0 did. But you, that soul, that body didn't experience any of that. He didn't go through any of the suffering or trials or anything like that. So ultimately, philosophically, if you will, the Jehovah's Witnesses are fighting a battle that they will never see the fruit of. They will never see the fruit of their obedience because it's not them. It's it's them 2.0. You know, it's Michael 2.0. So it's actually some random, some yeah. stranger that you've never met yep. that gets all their, their reaps all their rewards for your mm-hmm. suffering. Well, that's fascinating. Yes. And that's part of the, I think, reason we think about these things because I think that it might sound like a stupid attack if you're not into philosophy, but I, I don't know. If that was my thought, I would be kind of miffed that that's the way things worked (laughs) like it's not even me it's some other guy whatever and then of course we haven't talked much about it but atheists naturalists materialists they obviously believe in um, at least on paper they believe in just the body Mm -hmm. and if it's just the body often a classic atheist line is that when you're dead you're dead you're just worm food and they love to use that worm food thing um well, there's no eternal life there. So I guess that just adds to the whole nihilistic, nothing matters, atheist view. That because it's such a sad and pointless view, a lot of atheists that I've met, and even publicly, they they kind of don't take such a strong stance on there being nothing afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, so they kind of like believe in a soul only because the human spirit wants to, like it knows, it testifies. So uh, I don't think you'll find a lot of atheists that actually practically hold to the whole we're totally dead nothing else happens afterwards they're usually agnostic ultimately at least to that extent yes and we talked about it on our episode on atheism i almost said gnosticism atheism yes and how well not only is it an, a human body is not designed to think that way we hold mm-hmm. like, we hold that we are created in the image of god and thus we have that yearning to be redeemed restored with the right to, with to a right relationship with our creator so to suppress that you're going to the extreme opposite answer and there's absolutely nothing there's no meaning let's just eat drink and, and actually no that also okay put a hole in that drink eat and be merry and, and rejoice for tomorrow we die a consistent atheist would be an, uh, a nihilist yeah like just... you you, like, you cannot be an atheist you okay I understand you can live your life you can think in your head i'm an atheist and then live your life contradicting that idea in your head i understand you can do that but you should not be doing that if you're cons- if you want to be consistent because if you're an atheist but if there's nothing then there's no meaning there's no purpose but people don't live that way yeah hence why there's that contradiction that inconsistency and why in our episode we ho- we said not only are they agnostic but that dissatisfaction with pure atheism leads many not all but many to stuff like buddhism new age Mm -hmm. and that's spirituality mysticism not religion but spirituality that that encompasses that that spectrum so i also think you know for the biologist wanting usually atheists are really into science or whatever they call science um i think there's a biological problem this creates to think that we're just the body because now they'll appeal to mystery and maybe ironically enough um, because they would accuse christians of appealing to mystery all the time and not understanding things but they appeal to mystery as far as how the brain works because the the skeleton key for somebody who's a naturalist materialist is the brain that the brain is the thing that operates all our feelings and wants and emotions and memories and all that and so I mean, we know it obviously contributes. To, I'm not saying the brain doesn't. Like the, the brain is an organ that contributes to your thoughts, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but the the thing is, to me and to my understanding, the brain is just a network of active and moving, but a network of connections like the internet. And imagine you had the internet all set up and it's got all the pages everywhere, but there was nobody behind the computer screen clicking on anything. It would be all these things to access and no clicker and now the the atheists will say that external stimuli is that clicker for example the sun shining into your eyeball causes you to look away right so that's that's the clicker that all the external that gets the ball rolling for all the chemical reactions in your head but we i think from experience we know that 
that's just not the case all the time. Like sometimes it's the case we have involuntary reactions. Like if there's a bad smell, we curl our nose or if the doctor hits that part of our knee, our legs go up. You know, there's some things that that are genuinely Mm -hmm. hardwired. They're just, you know, stimuli in, stimuli out. Uh, But we know there's a lot of aspirations and other greater things like, um, for example, love versus just lust. Like there's the want to mate, which I guess you could say is just purely instinctual. Mm -hmm. And then there's like love and appreciation and joy that we know from experience are bigger than just the body telling us like, oh, be happy now. Like there's a difference between doing heroin and, you know, seeing your your kid born. You know, there's there's they're both bodily like your body reacts to them in happy ways but your soul doesn't react in happy ways all the time right <laughs> uh, so i think they're they're at a loss for who's the controller behind all the mechanisms they just say oh it must be there must be some external stimuli that's starting it all off well for heron you might have a so a spiritual reaction but that might be just showing up so <laughs> you could, yeah, i guess you could spiritually love uh, you probably do i think heroin addicts do spiritually love heroin um no, I'm starting like demons showing up and trying to yes. do bad things. But yeah, anyway, yeah. anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. But yeah, and then things like art and music, mm-hmm. those have absolutely no worth in our survival. Yet humans, for whatever reason, we appreciate that. We appreciate art. We appreciate mm-hmm. music, beauty, nature. There's something There's something more to that, that than just that happy feeling that you get from eating or from drugs or what, whatever whatever it may be is something just really based like that yeah it's at least anomalous like i think listen to the circular logic of atheists a lot because uh, they're the predominant religion of the culture i think they would probably say oh there must be some reason that evolution praise be upon him has given us those traits because they must um help trust their like social cohesion and that betters the survival rate of the species or something. So I'm sure they come up with some excuse, but in any case, I think one to one, we all know personally that more than just the body. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to the second view, which is the opposite of this. So if there's the view that we're only the body, there's another view often taken up by like new age people, but also kind of less so other myriad religions that we are really only the soul. So there, I would split this into two categories. There's there's some beliefs that say that the real, like physical world is all an illusion. So it's not really real that we're, you know, brain in a vat or something like that, or we're just spirits that think physical matter, matter is real, but it's not. And that it's all an illusion. We really are just our soul. Or there's, there's beliefs that say, yes, we are currently in physical matter, but ultimately we are just the soul. And it's better that we be the soul than to be in physical matter. For more information, check our episode on Gnosticism. Yes, exactly. So Gnosticism is one that I was thinking of that has, they believe that physical matter is real, but that it's evil, and that ultimately we are souls, which is good, but that we are trying to escape the physical world to to be with their ultimate God and escape the true living God um, because he's evil and a bunch of other stuff. Again, go see our episode on Gnosticism if you want to hear more. And less radical and wicked as Gnosticism. I mean, okay. To me buddhism or hinduism in which you're trying to escape the physical world get away from it mm-hmm. i'm trying to get this guy to get to do an episode on buddhism so hopefully we can do we can <laughs> really do turn the key actually we found call sister we got we got a, a user request one of our fans huh um from facebook asked sent us a request for an episode and guess what we put it on the schedule so you'll probably be seeing it sometime late september so if you anyone at home has a suggestion for an episode you're free to to let us know either on twitter facebook or wherever you might comment and i'm sure me or sebastian will see it and we have a schedule we schedule all the episodes so if you want to request an episode we'll probably do it unless it's something obscene or something that i want to do or we've already covered it fully but yeah we're going to do an episode on boozing that's the plan exciting well there well there it is yeah it's 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 down then okay and for those religions as you can see the goal is and we'll, i'll talk about that after i read that some of the pali canon and i'll quote some nice some nice stuff for that they you want to avoid sexual relations you want to avoid the pleasures you want to avoid all the physical senses because that's bad it's not as blasphemous as gnosticism is explicitly but you're still trying to get rid of you're trying to go into the nothingness so your spirit to get out to keep ascending into different in buddhism at least to keep ascending to different heavens and continuously get up closer to that nothingness 
it's just your spirit becomes with just becomes one with the with the universe and then you fade away mm -hmm. so two types one that's one that's extremely hostile and the other one this one's a little bit i would say more more a more gentle approach yeah and you could even see some of that kind of philosophy creeping into christian traditions like monasticism where monks were all about oh, yeah. like oh this body's evil and temperance and whipping yourself and and starving yourself and a lot of other things that uh aren't like they might at their best they're representing and, and showing discipline bodily self-control which is a, a virtue it's a gift of the spirit but at worst they are denigrating things that god has made for good yes we know that the flesh is fallen and we know it has bad impulses but ultimately god put us here and will be giving us a flesh again the physical world is not evil just the conclusion of our gnosticism episode by the way but god made it for good and therefore we don't have to hate um, having a body now we might hate the bad impulses of the body but that should be kept separate from hating the body itself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and on that Thank goodness. Actually, thinking about it, I didn't live in the Middle Ages. You know, you can whip yourself all you want. You can starve yourself as a monk. But the worst thing that they did, they wouldn't bathe. Was that one of the punishments? The, so, some okay. of the people, they just refused to bathe. Got like it. Catherine of Siena, for example. Oh, yeah. She yeah. never bathed her entire totally life. I'm glad I wasn't alive back then <laughs> <laughs> or met any of those people. Oh, they're living alone, I think, for that reason, right? <laughs> Lost all their teeth and whatever else. Yeah. Uh, one of the ones, so that, those are ones probably we're more familiar with ones that think the physical body is bad it exists but it's bad there's mm -hmm. also a pretty famous religion at least here in the in america called christian science which is not oh it's not really christian it just uses christian to it's not even as christian as mormons and i wouldn't call it mormons christians it's less christian than them it's it's the belief that uh i, I don't even really know how it ties into christianity is why i say that whole caveat i think because the majority culture here in the United States is Christian. They just call it Christian because, but it's really totally new age. It's the belief that the physical world is an imagination. It's an illusion. It's not actually here. And that we are like souls in a vat. So not brains in a vat because brains aren't real either, but that we are souls trapped into this illusion that things are real and we're all in this like combined hallucination. So it's like a spiritual matrix. It's exactly okay. <laughs> except the matrix has a brain and a bat, right? There's the body and the bat. Yes, this so one is just like a soul matrix. Matrix. So in Christian science, yeah. they believe one of their big tenets is that you can <laughs> overcome the matrix. You can overcome this physical existence just by willpower. And therefore, they don't believe in getting sick. They believe if you got sick, you got tricked by the world and thinking that you um, got a virus when in reality, the virus doesn't even exist. In fact, your body doesn't even exist. So you can just will yourself out of the illusion that we're in the physical world, which is... I think patently false that Christian scientists would argue, of course, and they'll have their own case studies. But I think for the most of us, it's not even a temptation to believe that that's true. So I won't harp on it too much. Maybe we'll do an episode on Christian science one day, but it's um, not as popular these days. So it's not one that I want to get into right now. Same with um, Scientology, also one declining in popularity, but they also believe that the physical existence is certainly evil. Like you're trying to get out of it and you've got, You've got um, spirit statins on you. I'm trying to remember if it's an illusion ultimately. I don't really know. Scientism, Scientology is crazy. Uh, so <laughs> like more crazy than, <laughs> than most things in there. Rabid. Probably this is bad to say if there's any Scientologists watching. It's not very nice of me to say. But generally society regards it as crazy. Um, and they also don't like the physical body. They're about the spiritual, uh, uh, you know, getting above your physical body, eventually leaving your physical body. So we would deny those and say that God created bodies. He, in fact, incarnated in a body, not a fake body, not an illusion body, but a real body. And eventually, for the saints, it will be a blessing that we will be reincar reincarnated, re resurrected <laughs> into, the, into living bodies and live on this physical earth. So it is God's intended way for mankind to live is physically on the earth he created all the physical matter out there it's not evil so we wholeheartedly and biblically reject a view that says that physical matter is evil it's those views are evil they're anti-god right so we're not just fully material bodies as atheists or jehovah's witnesses I mean, mixing and of course with their own thing would say and at the same time this isn't just a a trashy place in which we're trying to escape the main thing is to get away from here and then into the spirit realm. So we have a spirit and at the same time, the physical, the body is good because God made it. 
So that's the balance that we hold to from scripture. Yep. Speaking of, let's get into it. So I've got, <laughs> you see my battle station here. I'm going to adjust myself. My battle station has got all my things. If you were on any of the uh, previous episodes, you'll see that this main monitor is the one giving me like the light of God on my face normally. So this is where I've got my scripture pulled up. The kind of pinnacle verse that I think of when I think of this the biblical model for how we are and what we are made up of is the Shema Israel, which is the command of Deuteronomy 6. This is one we've talked about before. Me and you, Sebastian, because we're nerds, have memorized it in Hebrew. It's the first commandment, and Jesus will, repeats it as the first and most important commandment of God in the Bible. So Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Um, so the so pause, that's that's where Christians typically get our threefold version of self. Um, there are differing views within Christian thought, and so I want to entertain those, but I mm-hmm. would hold to a threefold at least um, version of the self where you have a heart, a soul, and a strength. Now, strength, I think, is pretty clear, and even the Hebrew word, and, and when it's translated in the Greek, the Greek word is is like physical strength. It is your body. I would say that that is love. That you, could, you could say, love the Lord God with all your body, when they say strength. So, we want to worship Him with our bodies. The Bible says our body is a temple, so it's not something to belittle. It's mm-hmm. something to take care of. It is a gift of God. It was bought at a price. So, love Him with all your body. So, so eat well and exercise well, and don't go flinging yourself around. Don't go cutting yourself or... Um, putting poison into you or other things like that. Treat don't the body stop well. showering, please. Don't stop showering. Don't pull your teeth for no reason. Right? <laughs> I would say even don't flagellate yourself. Or um, There's that verse from Jesus where he says, cut off the hand that causes you to sin or gouge with the eye. I would say don't do that in accordance with this. Um, I would argue that Jesus is saying it spiritually. He's not actually saying cut off your hand, gouge out your eye. Um, so, so there mm. you go. So love with your strength. I think that's the least controversial one. Uh, it also says, love God with all your heart. This mm-hmm. one's pretty American culture-y. I don't think it's too strange for Americans to understand the heart. And I think it's it's what you think of, your your impulses, that, that internal impulse. I was calling it the soul previously, but I guess this isn't calling it the soul. This is calling it the heart. That, your emotions. Your emotions. Your emotions, your wants. I would say the, the heart is the one that's really pushing you to eat and drink, um, like when you don't have a body, I suppose, in, in Sheol or wherever. Um, but the heart, so love them with all your emotions. So the emotions aren't necessarily, sometimes the heart is wrong, like Jeremiah famously says, um, the heart is wickedly sick, who can understand it, right? So, and, and God says we had hearts of stone, he put us hearts of flesh. So now we can react with emotion well. And of course, our emotions can be wrong, mm-hmm. so we want to keep it under check, but our emotions are good and we should love God with our emotions. We shouldn't be emotionless, for example. Even if you, if you come to Minnesota, Lutheran influence is so strong that most churches are like, you know, a psalm is playing, and the most you're going to get is a little bit of hip rocking. Maybe not even that. Maybe <laughs> standing completely still. Um, which doesn't look like you're worshiping with all your heart, but, you know, we can't see the inside of people. <laughs> <laughs> that and, reminds me from a Babylon, I mean, it's for Presbyterians that the rioters, they mistake a congregation of Presbyterians for statues. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's a joke. It's a joke. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then with all your, your soul. So the soul here. And maybe Sebastian, you want to go into the soul here in Hebrew is probably the most complex thoughts. Uh, I think it's simplest. It's just your mind. So all your thoughts and the things we had been talking about in the beginning of this episode. But mm-hmm. do you want to go into like the word and other things like that? Yes. Yes. The, mo- the common word used for soul in Hebrew is nefesh. And oh, Jehovah's Witnesses, they love going to this word because they latch on to just one single meaning of the word. Nefesh, like in Hebrew, can mean many things like not only like uh, your soul like that such in your spirit in that sense but it can also mean a living being for example in genesis it's just right all it's used very frequently in genesis 1 and 2 for the fish of the sea all the creatures they're called nefesh they're living beings they're living beings of the sea living beings of the land and same for uh, humans they refer to as nefesh so the, it mean yes there's that implication of a f- of a physical thing that you can touch a creature creature i think that would be the the appropriate word at the same time like it like with anything it can have many different uh, meanings for example i mean some just came to my mind right now fire it could be 
the actual fire when you light a candle or it can be commanding fire a group of people to fire are you are you telling them to like start cre like creating a, cam a campfire in the spot no you're telling them shoot open fire so that would be the similar how one word can have different meanings in different in different contexts so nefesh like that soul living being can mean a person can also be a desire so for in genesis 2 an example would be here when he when god form when yahweh formed man from dust i'm also reading this in hebrew so if i, if I speak strangely oh, the scholar yes yeah, so they, they 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 phrase things backwards so if, if i read strangely understand that's why and breathe so in, into, into the nostrils breath of life and became man a nefesh a living being so that would be the context and also for it can be used inter interchangeably with the word soul uh, in in the Septuagint the word suche which is soul in Greek that's what it's used to replace nefesh and suche it's all used in the New Testament it also means your soul that part of your body so this is a very complex word as you can see probably I've been saying a lot hopefully you got the main mm -hmm. the main the main gist of that nonetheless it is it is not just one meaning so it doesn't just mean your spirit it can mean a creature but it can also mean the the spiritual aspect of things another word that I think is also worthwhile mentioning next to it would be ruach which would be breath wind or spirit so the spirit of god floating in the water in the waters in the darkness doing hand gestures too that's probably how it floated how it floated too <laughs> my hand is a dolphin yep yeah and same also is used as the wind but those are those are those are different components to ruach and nefesh important components that uh, the breath of life we are the, we are we carry the, the the life in us point of the story hebrew is very complicated well, I mean, even in English, I think we have a similar kind of complication with the word soul because we'll we'll also use it synonymously for somebody's whole person. Like we'll say, airline pilots say we had 152 souls on board. That's a thing. And we'll say uh, soul music. I mean, we <laughs> soul food. We, we have a lot of soul things too. And it's kind of like we make it, and that's even at the beginning of this episode, I was kind of meaning the heart um, versus the mind but here in context in hebrew it's talking about i think the mind because it already says the heart um but some i know some pastors and some christians would because of all this complication of what does it really mean the soul some would say that we are body and soul just the two and that your soul encompasses your heart and your mind okay i mean i can kind of get behind that i think it's kind of strange to say that and then also see deuteronomy 6 4 which says heart soul and strength that separates heart out of soul um but in any case that's not egregious to me because we know that soul and can encompass a lot. So mm -hmm. it kind of depends on what you mean by soul. And if you mean soul like the Jehovah's Witnesses mean soul, then I disagree <laughs> with you. But if you mean soul like that American pastor version that I've heard before that says that soul is both your mind and your heart, well, then I'm, you know, I'm agreeable. I might point out and say, well, what do you think about the Deuteronomy 6 4 that separates them? But it's not altogether too important as long as you realize that the soul. Is a, is a non-physical thing and it encompasses your either both your heart and your mind, so your thoughts and your feelings, or one of the other. So it might be just your mind or it might be just your heart. Um, interestingly enough, just to, to give more biblical reference, I know that John MacArthur, and I've, every time he references Deuteronomy 6.4, he says, um, love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strengths. That's four. And I'm always like, why is he doing that? When we were Prepping for this episode, I, I read, I think this is why he's doing it. I can't speak for John MacArthur, but when Jesus references uh -huh. the Deuteronomy 6, 5, presumably, um, he's asked in one of the times in Matthew 22, one of the people asks him, teacher, what command is the greatest? And then he says, love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. Second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So that's interesting notice the difference there he says love your 
God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind instead of strength. He's replacing strength there, which is odd. Um... It's odd because it's not even what the Septuagint. It's not like he's quoting the Septuagint or anything. It's just a change. I'm not sure if he's quoting someplace else. That's not Deuteronomy 6.5, but we couldn't find it when we were looking a little bit. Um, so it is a a difference, and it could just be that that Jesus is getting to the root of that command, anyways, and that is to love God with all that you have. I mean, I think we're all in agreement there that that's really what the verse is trying to say. It could also be Jesus pointing out that it's more important to love Him with your heart, soul, and mind, so the untangible aspects than it is to, with your strength, uh, because eventually our strength will fade and we'll die. Now, mm-hmm. we'll be resurrected and put into a body again, but it could be that he's pointing out it's more important to love him with your with your heart and mind and your soul. Anyways, in this case, soul is separated from heart and mind, so what exactly is the soul? could be just the full encompassing being of who you are uh, intangibly. I couldn't say. There's not much context here to tell you. Yes, and I mean, I just wanted to throw out there too. The the words are different. Well, that's I found that really I found it surprising. So, for what Jesus quotes in Matthew twenty two, the mind is the anua, which is deep thought. As in, uh, you're really really concentrated in that. That's the implication of that. And then here from the Septuagint, that I was happy I could find it on Nap. For really hard to find Septuagint on a regular. Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament that they would have been using in Jesus' time, by the way. Yes. And strength used is dunameos. So you can see the Anua and dunameos. Back so, in 6.4, you mean? Back in Deuteronomy 6.4? Yes, back in Deuteronomy See, In my mind, it, this all makes sense. Yes. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> yes. I think a lot of that stuff. So strength also dynamic. That's where we get the word duna, uh, dynameos. So dynamic. I would say still the message is the same. You're still with all your might. That's the in the the mouse and the one in Hebrew as well, implying strength, might, force, putting it. And likewise, the word used for mind is not just the mind. It is extreme mindfulness, like deep thought. So I would say still exertion. So I would say the message is still like the message is there. It's mm-hmm. not. Contradict. Yeah. Do with that what you will, because it, it excludes body. But I would say the law stands. Jesus says, <laughs> you know, truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one's letter or the smallest part of a letter will um, pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. So I would say that Deuteronomy six four six five, they stand. So it's not like we're going to disregard the fact that it says strength there in in any translation. Um, nor are we going to disregard the fact that Jesus says soul, mind, and heart. So that's why. John MacArthur, one of the famous ones, will always add four in there instead of just the three. He, he puts mind in there as well as soul, heart, and body. Um, but it, it doesn't really ultimately change, I think, your full view of self. That's why I've been saying throughout this episode, I would hold to a three-point view, heart, soul, and strength, with the caveat that I know Jesus says heart, soul, and mind instead of strength. So you could say four. It's not going to offend me. I can see that. But I would just, for simplicity's sake, and because I'm mm-hmm. including uh, mind in soul, then I'm... I'm saying heart soul and strength and you could go even simpler and say two you know soul and body but it neither offend me particularly right and we know we, i went through looking at other places where the bible talks about soul unsurprisingly it's it's normally talking about the heart and um, there's a lot of places in psalms and other things like that that talk about the soul i don't know that it's really worth going through but i'll give you a tiny snapshot uh, psalm 119 my soul weeps because of grief strengthen me according to your word there's your soul. So it could be your mind weeping, it could be your heart weeping. I think they're kind of synonymous here. Uh, John 12, now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. So you can see Jesus has a soul and it's troubled. So I would assume that is his emotions could also be his mind. Uh, Proverbs, the fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. And he who is wise wins souls. There's, I think that one of the American uses for souls too, that is like general people, beings, right? Uh, Luke 12, 19, this is kind of an interesting one. This is a parable from Jesus talking about the rich man who's storing up all that stuff in that grain storage place and he ultimately dies and it's all fruitless. That man says to himself, and I will say to my soul, so he's saying to his soul, which mm-hmm. to me alludes to the psalmist saying to his heart, he, you know, he tells his heart to rejoice. Here's this guy saying to his soul, so you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. That kind of atheist kind of thing. Right. This guy's mm-hmm. doing it. Um, I guess you don't have to be an atheist. You just have to be a butthead. Um, 
<laughs> but he he's telling his soul like like you might tell your heart rejoice because your rational mind is telling your heart you know be glad um, like people do when they're depressed I mean you say that to your heart these days so I think soul um, is kind of used as a heart in in the Old Testament and New Testament combined so again there's some the soul is one of those weird ones we're not really sure exactly how to categorize it but clearly it has something to do with non-tangible things one and two it must be some combo of the heart and mind or something like that yeah so the main point is it's distinct from the body that's the yes that's the that's yeah. the, main, the main point and in most often the psalms the word used uh, to me was interesting is nefesh so yeah could be spirit but nefesh as well so so not just a living being but also your soul your spirit Mm-hmm. and something that came to mind I think is worth mentioning you mentioned turning the heart of stone into a heart of flesh mm-hmm. well that would mean that the heart is what's transformed not necessar- not your body not your mind when the spirit acts on you well and we also know that the mind is renewed by his word that's a, that's a Pauline letter saying mm-hmm. right the renewing of the mind so I think uh, at least I think all na- non-tangible parts of yourself are uh, renewed here in this life, and then eventually your body is even renewed in the next life. So That's I think all of in. what you are is renewed, but yeah, the heart is, se- I think, separate from the mind, but the r- mind is also renewed. Mm-hmm. And I was uh, encountering, uh, it looked familiar from Galatians 5 to emphasize the distinction is that for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. So there's this dynamic between both. Yeah, and spirit there is, an, I think, synonymous with soul. Right, that word right, is. right. Exactly. Uh, let's put a pin in that because that I want to talk about actual practical applications of all this vain philosophy. Um, but last, I think we'd be remiss not quoting this one from is this Matthew 10. This is still in Matthew from Jesus. He says famously, Do not fear those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Um Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and body in hell, which I think is pretty slam dunky against the JWs. I don't know how they respond to that. I haven't heard them respond to that text. I'm sure they have some way to respond to it because it seems like such a slam dunk against those who would separate the body and the soul. Or, those, sorry, those that would com- combine them, say that they're you know essentially one and the same. Mm-hmm. Because if people can kill the body, what, how is God killing the soul different? You know, like... There must be the soul must be separate from the body because God is able to kill both. Right. I mean, it seems pretty straightforward. You just can't, you just can't mix them into one. I also think it's important to note. I don't want to get too much into this because we can get into semantics and weird medieval theology, but I I think the the, the death of the soul for those annihilationists out there are those who have proclivities towards that way. The death of the soul I don't think needs to be ceasing to exist. Like when the body dies. It doesn't cease to exist. It's just no longer active, mm-hmm. right? Now, I guess it could, you know, you could like grind it up and or let it decay enough that it turns to dust and whatever. And I guess you, you would cease to exist. But in the same way that when the body dies, the body's not immediately gone. The soul is not gone when it's dead. It's just in agony. It's no longer living. Like that old American saying, like, is this, you know, is this really living? If you're you know, trapped in slavery or whatever, uh-huh. people say that kind of thing. I, same with the soul, like the rich man of Lazarus, just to go back to that parable. Clearly, the the rich man's soul is dead, but it's not unconscious. It's conscious in, in torment, but it is a dead soul. So when this verse says, uh, fear the one who is able to destroy both the soul and body in hell, I don't believe he's saying that you'll cease to exist in hell. I think he's saying that it'll be destroyed as in it's made barren, like weeping and gnashing of teeth, that kind of thing. Oh, like when you're, we're talking about like in a game, like they completely destroyed the other team. Yes. They didn't actually exterminate. They're, like yeah. some Mayan game. No, it was, it was it's just a form of speech. Yeah, I have verbally, I guess, if you will, maybe. Yes. I don't know. Yeah. But putting that aside, let's actually talk about the practical implications. We've talked a lot about, you know, what could the truth be? But how do we actually use this? When would we even, why are we even talking about this? Why is it even important, Sebastian? Is there any gain you can glean from a proper view of the soul and body and mind and whatever else of who we are? Yes, because I think, some, some say, I have uh, experience with uh, some people 
from other faiths and also from other from fellow Christians that think why even study this why even bother with this just focus on your relationship with Jesus oh, I know you love I know you love that focus on your relationship with Jesus and how can you be better at that I think that understanding this actually enhances that enhances your walk as a Christian how you may ask for if you understand the components of what makes us that I think enhances how the transformation that I was uh, asking Michael about for what exactly took place when we became Christians what was different before and after mm -hmm. so what what changed what changed and I think understanding that actually gives you a deeper I would say connection not only with 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 the Lord because you are you understand now better what you were taken out from because of the state of your soul before you be, you were redeemed by 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 God mm. in the sense the orthodox believe that we are sick not that we're spiritually dead as reformed people we believe that you are a we're spiritually dead well, obviously we're not physically dead we're still walking around but we're in rebellion we're separated from god and nothing that we can do no clever thought that we have no insight no divine inspiration like a buddha is going to bring us closer to god it is him that does that so understanding that state that we were in how that relates to our mind and then how that then that translates to how we live our lives that to me that makes me want to thank god even more my goodness i was a wretch i was a piece of junk before he had mercy and it was undeser undeserving too and then you can also see a transformation later so hence why i couldn't resist to quote galatians for mm -hmm. for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh they're in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want so that is useful because it gives you this it gives you awareness of what you're going to be struggling with in your work as a Christian because some people are like okay you know I became a Christian I'm going to go to church so it's good that's, please continue doing that at the same time you should be studying the Bible on your own you should be diving into the Pauline letters you put into the Old Testament if you want to go above and beyond do some church history read, read it in Greek and Hebrew whatever it may be but it's not just our salvation our Part of our sanctification is understanding what we're going to struggle with. Part of that is our flesh has not been redeemed. That, I would say, is clear from Scripture. Mm -hmm. It is our, our the, the mind, the soul, that has been put in the right path, in the right relationship with God to be eventually fully, 100% fully redeemed after, after Jesus comes back his, during his second coming. That, I would say, to me, is extremely practical. Because now I'm aware, okay, I'm going to have these strange cravings. Could they be spiritual attacks? Sure, from the enemy. We talked about that as well. But now you're aware of that. And I think being aware of that is the first step in how you can grow in your sanctity towards God. Mm -hmm. That will be, to me, that's a very, very useful. Yeah, and I think that's the kind of exactly what I would say, Sebastian, that it's, it's not necessary, like if you're driving a car, it's not necessary to have all the gauges in front of you. You can just drive without knowledge of any of the gauges, but it's useful to know all the gauges because then you know when you should take a pit stop for gas or when you're about to hit 100,000 miles, when you might need maintenance, like the, your engine's getting hot, whatever. There's a lot of reasons to know the gauges. Similarly with understanding how you're made up, um, you can go about your day without really contemplating any of this philosophy. But if you, if we're correct in, in our understanding that we're body, mind, and soul or whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. amalgamation like that we can better figure out okay so we know the flesh is corrupt so the flesh will often fight us to do things that we don't want to do as galatians says as a theme throughout the bible but that doesn't mean that like all is lost like because my flesh is wanting it i'm sinning because um, you can you can fight the flesh knowing that it's only a third of who you are or whatever you want to however you want to translate that um it's only a portion of who you are it is you but we're trying to put to death that side of the flesh that wants to rebel and therefore it's not something to freak out about or like um be like well yeah, yeah flagellant sure but also like um 
like hopeless about. It's not something to be hopeless about just because your flesh is reacting a certain way. Of course, you can pray that God put that part of the flesh to death and you want it to be put to death, but it, it doesn't mean that your soul and mind were also in tandem doing that. Now, your soul or your heart and soul, whatever, I'm <laughs> mixing all my words now, your soul, I'll just use one, you know, heart and mind mm -hmm. being one soul. It doesn't mean your soul was in on it. Now, your soul can, you know, start contributing to what your flesh wants to do, but I would say it doesn't necessitate that. And so knowing that difference is important. And in the same way, when you're saved, you know, you didn't suddenly grow like a magic tattoo that says, you know, Christian right here. It, clearly your soul was the one that was saved and eventually our flesh will be redeemed. It's just not here. So it, I think it's pretty important and necessary part of reality to know that you're more than one part. Even when you're sad, you know, like when you're sad, it doesn't necessarily mean that you thought something wrong or you understood something wrong. It could just be that your heart is being dumb or is reacting well to whatever is around mm -hmm. it. And knowing that it's separate from your mind, your rationalness allows you to speak to your heart like even the psalmist does or, or um, others do in the scriptures saying, you know, heart, soul, whatever you're going to call it, you know, be glad or be sad. Maybe you're not remorseful for something like there's there's reasons to speak to your heart. And maybe your heart needs to speak to your head, although rarely I think your heart is usually <laughs> if you're if your heart and mind are out of concert, it's usually your heart who's in the wrong. I'm um, just going back to that Jeremiah quote about the heart being desperately sick. But again, knowing that your multiple parts is useful so that you can correct ones that go out of kilter, just like the gas on a car, you know, you have to fill it with gas or if the gas is fine, you might, your engine might be too hot. So, you know, you need to, um, cool it down or give it some time or not. I've never had an engine overeat. So I don't know what you do with a hot <laughs> engine. That'll, uh, pull over. Um, yeah. So I think that's ultimately why it's useful to even talk about this. And so it is applicable to your everyday life. And again, we don't know all the exact answers. It's not like there's a super rule book. We showed you a lot of the relevant verses in the Bible. So it's not like it's super dissecting it, um, but it's certainly not the, we're only a soul um, hating the body kind of mm -hmm. attitude. And it's certainly not, we're only a body hating the soul kind of attitude. And I think this will resonate with all of us. Romans seven. We know that start first. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual soul as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do for I, what I for what I want to do I do not do but what I hate I do and if I do what I do not want to do I agree that the law is good as it is it is no longer my I myself who do it but it is sin living in me for I know that good itself does not dwell in me that is in my sinful nature for I have the desire to do what is good but I cannot carry it out for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do this. I keep on doing now. If I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Reading this in English for me is a struggle yeah. too many do's in Greek. There's three different verbs, practice, carry out and do. I think that, they could have done that here. I would have much appreciated that, you know, some variation in the words. But nonetheless, there is that, again, from Galatians, there is that battle between your intellect, soul, mind, heart, whatever you want to call it, and then your body, which can, and then partially your heart as well, because your heart can have spasms of impulses that mm -hmm. are sinful too. So, so we're, clearly we're not perfect. Otherwise, we'd be glowing like Jesus now. So... We are not. We have been set on the right path towards Christ to be like Christ, but we have not been perfected yet. That's why even someone as I would say as holy and set apart as the Apostle Paul, he has this had these struggles as well. So there's no need to beat yourself up. There's no need to stop sh showering. Please don't do that. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason to despair. That's what you were saying. Don't, don't, there's no reason to fear. Should you repent if you are not remorseful for sin or if you are aware of what you've done? Of course, of course you should repent. And that is part, I would say, of sanctification. But nonetheless, it stands here that there's something going on up here versus what's being actually carried out by the apostles. So... Yeah, and I don't even know how you'd make sense of that the whole thing. Uh, it is kind of confusing in English. Probably confusing in Greek, frankly, but whatever. Hey. <laughs> English is the best language. Anyways, uh, it, there's no way to make sense of it if you don't have 
a two at least a two-fold model of who you are right that you've got yourself warring against yourself if you were one self it would be if you were only one component um it wouldn't make any sense that you'd be warring against yourself uh i think just a bonus reason of why it's important to think about these things is not only for the positive benefits of being able to gauge yourself and and understand your war against the flesh it's also to be on guard against false views so like we've already talked about there's the you know flesh only view or the spirit only view there's also just like a bunch of different psychology modern psychology visions of who you are some of them line up with the bible and are fine some of them don't and i think as christians we should find ones that at least line up with the bible for example a very very famous influential vision of who we are and what we're made up of is uh, sigmund freud's view mm -hmm. which is that we're the id ego and super ego so he's got a threefold um, but they're different and i don't think they're biblical they would say that your your impulses your id you know the bad things you always want to eat i want to drink i want to you know have sex whatever um your ego which is your decision making rational mind and then your super ego which is like the good th like what society wants from you the things you know that are right essentially and this is portrayed in pop culture, by the way, by the devil on one shoulder, you, and then the angel on your right shoulder. That's the id, the ego, and the super ego. Mm -hmm. um, I, that's not accurate. Might feel kind of accurate because because of the war of your flesh against your soul, and then the attacks of the actual enemy. You know, actual devils fighting you, and the and the actual God um, preaching to you. So it might feel kind of like that vision, but that's not a biblical vision. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's that you are neutral that that states that you are neutral and you're not That's you're definitely not neutral yeah yep or something else comes to mind you know very popular that you might when well, in the middle ages they exaggerated spiritual attacks when something was phys a physical ailment yes and also nowadays when something is spiritual they say no just take medicine for it so we have completely gone from mm -hmm. a witches and uh, exorcisms to everything just just take meds just take supplements for that so i think there has to be a balance i'm not i'm not criticizing either you might need to do an exorcism every once in a while that, <laughs> i'll leave that i'll leave that up for each situation and of course you need pills every once in a while and you need pills every once in a while too so how else are you gonna wake up in a bees and show a beachy that you're cool hashtag my <laughs> fellow millennials out there gen z or whatever we are uh Okay, getting off track. I think that's that's all we have to say, right, Sebastian? I think so. All right, I well, so. thank you for watching. We have been the Found Cause, your Founder Cause and Servant Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to see the rest of our episode, or uh, first of all, I've been Michael, the man behind this battle station in front of me, and to my actual physical left on your screen is Sebastian, the bookkeeper. Thanks for listening. If you want to see the rest of our episodes, you can go to foundcause.podbean.com and download them all for your listening pleasure. This is number 57, so we've got 56 more for you to see. Some of them, I think the recent 10, 7, are video. The rest of them are audio only, but hopefully they're entertaining nonetheless. You can also go to facebook.com forward slash foundcause and see all our videos there. We also post on YouTube every Saturday, and we are on iTunes, Spotify, any other podcasting places that you know and love. So until next time when we talk about something completely different, thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.